He's a very good player. Recently, he's looked like a pretty good inter. Can you imagine a timeline where first Humanoid smacks Jovi and then Caps destroys Faker? No, if we if they win Worlds, I will shave my head. I'll do it publicly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the jungle. I am substitute host this week all the way here from uh, Chengdu, China. I'm joined by Abroxa and by Cubby. And this week, we'll be talking about roster rumors, Vanguard being added to League of Legends, but first, let's kick off with MSI. And most importantly, FlyQuest are out. Cubby, how does it make you feel? <laughs> wow. No. wow. We got to that fast for the T1 game, man. No mercy. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, wow, I, I, we're just going to start off with this. Uh, it, it, it was tough, man. Uh, I, I, there's like really no getting around it. I, I feel like with FlyQuest, you know, I, looking at the VODs from PSG and Fly, I really expected the first time around for Fly to 2-0, and I know they dropped the game like in that series, but that game was still quite winnable. And then we got our heads caved in by T1, but like, you know, it's T1, it's fine. You know, that that's gonna happen, I, even if it is like, you know, arguably faster or not than the Mad Lions game, who knows, it, it was out <laughs> there. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you get to the rematch against PSG and FlyQuest goes out there and like they just didn't look like a team that showed up on the day. There's really no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, I, I didn't, like their draft priority at all like they're giving the thanos champs over to you know psg uh the way that flyquest beat psg the first time was uh i think psg took aggressive bot lanes didn't get enough out of it flyquest ended up getting a lot like in the back half of the lane swap so what do we do this time uh we give them senna kench which is uh or senna not like it's proven to be super busted you know uh and we're just gonna hand it over like it's been denied pretty much the entirety of the split since LCK figured out that that was like the broken duo and what do we give it away for? Uh, Poke Ferris paired with Renata, which I don't think synergizes all too well together, and Urgot. Uh, I, I just don't know what happened. Like, it, it's... It feels like the entire team, like, everyone just kind of boomed, and the funniest part is that that's exactly what they're saying in the interviews afterwards now. So it, it's it's super weird. Speaking of interviews, I have a really interesting quote from a Jensen interview right after the loss, where he said, Shout out Ashley King. <laughs> they probably, <yeah. laughs> they probably <laughs> realized what mistakes they made against us. And when we beat them, we were kind of, yeah, expected. <laughs> we didn't really take too long or take too much away from the series. I guess we just disrespected them a little bit. So you're telling me that you guys beat PSG, and PSG actually took some time to learn from the series and go, like improving going into the next one. No shit. Like, <laughs> who would have expected that? Like, I don't even know how that's a real quote. Or, and, and not only deciding as a team that it's a waste of time to actually put an effort to learn from the first PSG series, where they could have learned a lot, especially uh, from, from the loss they had that arguably should have been a win. Yeah. No, 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 no. It was just an expected result. We just go into the next one. We're probably going to win for free. Like, it's just such a cocky and, and wrong mindset. And I think this... <laughs> it's just so sad. But I, I think generally this tournament, FlyQuest have been very, very out there um, with pretty disrespectful attitudes generally. Um, I, I think it's fair to say. And honestly, more than anything, this seems to be a little bit of a, a reality check for them. And it kind of looked like they thought the, the T1 series would go slightly different, but after they lost the first one in 17 minutes, they just tilted off the, the face of the earth and couldn't really recover. Yeah. I mean, you gotta expect, like, that's, there are so many weird things to me about this, because, like, the reality check should have been LCS finals, right? Everyone went into that final, like, we were all talking about how we expected FlyQuest to win, FlyQuest yeah. to perform. And then, if you don't have a reality check like from that and then also scrimming internationally for an extended boot camp that FlyQuest had, then well, like what's going on, right? I That's one weird one. And then I know the T1 loss was in more dramatic fashion than what was expected, but it's not like you're expected to win against T1. Um, and for me, like if you're getting your confidence nuked by losing against like one of the best teams in the world, like I mean, that's a reality check, right? But I, I think a lot of it's, like, it can be perspective, right? It can be motivating to be like, oh, shit, like, that's how the best teams in the league play the game. Like, we have to get there, right? Uh, if it's, like, an absolute confidence nuke and everyone is, like, done so with each other, then, like, where's the competitive mindset to fight back from that? 
Where's the learning that they could have done from getting fisted by T1 to then bring in the PSG after they beat them the first time around, right? Like, I don't know. I, it's I, like the first time like, against LCS, I, I kind of gave FlyQuest the hall pass, like the things that were said afterwards from that team, because it's like, you know what? This is like their first hiccup. Like, this is a team that has pedigree and these guys can show up. There is no hall pass this time around. Like, I, I actually don't know what happened in that camp and like what's going on. I, I And it's not like the loss to PSG, like, I'm not going to go out there and say, like, this is a super disastrous scenario. I thought from watching the tape going into this tournament, I expected FlyQuest to be better than PSG and get out of this group. PSG, by no means, was a terrible team. Like, they're, for me, the third best team that was in this stage of the tournament that wasn't the top two that, like, got ahead, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, it, it goes the two Eastern teams, and then it was Fly Fanatic and PSG in whatever order you wanted, like, for Fly Fan and then them. That's how I had it. It's not like it's a terrible loss, but... It just the response to it was terrible. And that's why I'm tilted on, on the backside of all this. Yeah, I think that's the thing, right? Like, if they'd gone in and lost to PSG 2-1, close series, like it was on day one, like, good team fights, getting down to, you know, dragon flips, etc., that's kind of more acceptable. But it was just so one-sided. It, was, it, it really felt like they were just lying down on the floor and just like, okay, cool, we're, we're already out, we're just going to lose... Uh, and the level of coordination between the players just didn't seem to be there, right? Like, you look at how Inspired was playing, and then you look at how the rest of the team was playing, and it just didn't seem at all on the same page. Um, I feel a lot for Masu. Um, I think he actually had a really good tournament uh, and was probably the best player on that team, at least from, like, an uh, outward perspective. Obviously, that's, you know, we don't know who's shot calling, et cetera, inside, but I think Masu had a really good tournament, and seeing how much it meant to him in the interview afterwards as well uh, obviously shows the drive that he has to try and improve um, but the rest of that team I, yeah, everyone just really struggled and maybe they can bounce back for summer I expect them to be at Worlds if they play like they do in the LCS but yep. maybe things collapse because you've lost in this fashion and I, you want to make changes right that's two moments now where this team has faced adversity and it has very negatively affected them, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I I mean, I share the same sentiment uh, with, you know, Masu having, a, I think, a really respectable tournament, especially for someone who he hasn't been playing competitive for even two years and it's his first split playing pro. That's pretty crazy uh, if yeah. you put that into perspective, like what he was doing out there. But uh, yeah, like the rest of the team, I mean, I don't know what's going on. And I put a lot of onus on, on the vets. Like they are the ones that... I think matter a lot in this team. Uh, they're the ones that I feel like call the shots and are stronger uh, and were the more important pieces throughout LCS. And it all kind of came crashing down uh, and it was really rough to watch. I think the the worst part for me is that, I mean, you already hyped up Masu and for a good reason. Like he was definitely the, the highlight player for, for Fly this tournament. And the worst part for me is that he seems to be like a legitimate good carry. Like he played against some really mm -hmm. good players and he, he showed up and he exceeded my expectations at least. And he was the only one on FlyQuest who actually did that. Uh, but it feels like the team just doesn't doesn't really trust him to do his job. Like he's literally playing weak side each and every game, no matter the position he's in and inspired, is always naturally gonna yes. have towards Bwibo and strong side Bwibo. And in some of the games they played, it worked to an extent in early and mid game, uh, where Bwibo was given big advantages. But the issue was that he could never actually utilize them to carry in mid, mid or late game. Like there was always over aggression, there was uh, terrible fights being taken, and all of a sudden this top lead just fades away, and you sit there thinking, well, if this keeps going wrong, over and over and over, why don't you eventually change up? Your, your style and trust this guy like just give him a game or two where you set him up for success and, and see what happens and I think um, it was similar with, with the lane swaps like they just seemed so set on playing a certain way that they just brute forced at every game Yeah. and I don't necessarily have an issue with them playing around Bwibo uh, that's part of why they lane swapped as well like some of the swaps gave Bwibo huge advantages mm -hmm. but if you do it please do it right and if it doesn't work do it differently and and when I say do it right, the problem is that the the bot duos they drafted weren't particularly great at lane swaps. Like usually you're gonna want some sort of a, a hyper carry, um, like a Jinx or an Aphelios, and you give them a free lane and you funnel some gold into them, but like that just wasn't the case and it it, it just felt like they completely sacrificed 
Masu and, and Busho for like no apparent reason. Like they they just never gained anything from it, and that made me yeah. sad to watch. I mean, yeah. it, like it was that. I know the T one series, like game one was what it was, but game two, like. I watched Inspired not flip his pathing to go towards the like the bot lane when they were going to get dove. Uh, like there was a moment or a time in the game where I think Inspired he could have ended up he he ended up like clearing uh, top to bot and he got Wu Kong level six because he got a red buff. If he ends up clearing bot to top, he doesn't get red buff. He's level five. Like he's there to defend a dive, and like that was a play that I saw coming like two minutes away going over the tape for that. And it's one where. Like the bot lane is top. They got the wave in. Guess what? It's slow stacking into you. Inspired had the opportunity to flip his pathing. No. He, like, runs across the map. He does gromp down. And guess what? He's on his red buff. His bot lane gets dove. They're out of the game. What does he get for it? And he blue buff. Like, that for me is him. Like, I, I can't fathom that decision as a jungler. I, I, I can see this from a mile away on my screen. And for me, like, seeing Inspired, like, make these types of decisions, I... It happened again in PSG with game two. Like that score line, people are memeing on it, saying like it's one v nine for inspired. It was the exact opposite. Like that is someone that was not playing for his team, and it's really weird because that for me is where I feel like sometimes inspired's biggest strength is it's being efficient, but also being efficient and matching what his laners need and being there to hover laners when they need it and figuring out ways to have game plans around that. And it felt like he kind of gave up on the team too, which was really weird to see. Uh, so yeah, I I don't know like. The way the flight quest went down was not promising. It was really disappointing. Yeah, it was very much a um, fuck it, let me lose in peace sort of. It, that's what the mentality kind Honestly, of felt yeah. like. You know, the T one yeah, game, game really two. felt like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a struggle as well because like, you don't know who's being really verbal. You know that Whipper and Inspired are probably talking a lot in the game just because they both talk a lot, like generally. And mm -hmm. Whipper has always been a very verbal player. Maybe Busio and Masu, Masu aren't calling for certain things, but. There, there just wasn't the synergy that you want to see from these guys, right? They weren't on the same page. They really struggled. And it's disappointing to see them go out as well. Because I thought, like, I didn't think that they'd be, you know, taking wins off Tez or, or maybe Tess, But, like, they're not going to beat a Gen G or a, or a T1 or BLG, right? But it's always nice to see players that I tend to like. I really like Whipper as a player. I really like him as a guy. It's nice mm -hmm. to see them on the international stage. It's nice to see them get experience. Masu and Butio as well. It's, it would be great to see them um, have the chance to like continue to grow uh, through international competition. And they don't get that chance because they just weren't as good as PSG. Um, I wonder if the back had flipped where the Flyquest would have gone through. Uh, it was something I was thinking about a lot where I actually quite oh, would have liked... I, I would have liked... like the bracket to flip just because then you don't get the rematches right like the yeah. FlyQuest versus Gam would have been cool um, I think anyone beats Gam I'm gonna be real <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah, anyone but say, Brazil yeah. apparently <laughs> yeah that, that Brazil should have beaten Gam too I don't know what happened yes they there. should um, another <laughs> oh, big man. disappointment uh, like CB LOL huge region obviously in League of Legends yeah. like massively viewed and it, they last year continued to look better and better and then mm -hmm. All they had to do was not try and kill the Nexus Towers. Like, you don't have Baron above. You're taking the in here. Why are we, why are we out forcing past this? They lose the fight and they get knocked out as well. Um, so, <sighs> yeah. yeah. Classic. A, a, a sequence of upsets, I think, in this planes, which I wouldn't really have expected. I think FlyQuest PSG is less of an upset than Gam beating Loud. Um, but yeah. I would have put FlyQuest probably 65 to 70, but over 30 to, to win that series, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I also think for them they didn't even need to be on the other side of the, the bracket they just needed to not play PSG then C1 and then PSG again like imagine if they just got knocked down to lose this bracket by T1 immediately yeah. it might have been an entirely different story but because they already beat PSG once they were complacent and then they lost the second one it, it yeah. meaning complacency is crazy too like, I, I think the one thing especially like with the high level league community like most people do respect grinders and going out in the interview, like as Jensen is saying, like, yep, you know what? Like, we didn't learn anything from that win, and we didn't learn enough from the T1 loss, and our confidence was nuked, and that's what it was. Like, that, that's kind of crazy. But I, I, I actually can't believe that was just the answer they came up with. That, yeah. That's, I can't remember seeing something like that in a long time. And that's why you shouldn't be uh, so complacent. Hit that like button, subscribe <laughs> to the channel. Oh, seamless. Smooth. If only I hadn't.
oh. misspoken. It would have been perfect. Moving on <laughs> from my great talks about YouTube uh, algorithms and such. Um, what's the next topic? This is why Ginny does this job. Because I now have to look at my phone to see what the next topic is. I mean, um, F- Fnatic got out. I-, I feel like we just go straight Fnatic. There. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a great topic to talk about. Let's talk yeah. about Fnatic. They got out. It is. Uh, they did get out. There Barca we go. Good. Lou. Nice, yeah. nice chat, guys. Is excellent. That it? We'll move on. <laughs> Fnatic got out. They're you know? good. Nah, go ahead. Right. Gubby, come on. Take it away. No, I- I'm actually curious. Like, Brox are like, I mean, you guys obviously follow this team. I'm not surprised Fnatic got out. But I think for me, Fnatic probably showed a better performance than expected i am curious like was this what you expect for them or was it better and like what were the big highlights for me it was june i thought june was awesome uh in, in plans I, I think what we've seen from fanatic so far is the most typical fanatic i have i've ever seen like looking at everything that's happened in the fanatic camp over the last couple of years where um they beat gam pretty convincingly there was no surprise i think in both series versus gam it's like there was some back and forth, and they gave up uh, some kills that they shouldn't and made some mistakes. Here Wait, there, quickly, were you having they... flashbacks, Boxer, when you saw the Nocturne locked in? Are you, are we, <laughs> <laughs> you were there just shaking in your room in Denmark? Like, no, not again. A little bit, it, a little they, bit. They banned I, it in the first series, game one. Man. Like, Worlds 2017, yep. Planes versus Scam, Jess's laning bots, level 3 That's, karma support, yep. and then Nocturne ult just comes out and we're all completely shocked. Like, yeah. oh, Five minutes into the game. <laughs> it oh, it was really insane. <laughs> that, that was a rough one. I'm, they smashed us that game. <laughs> no, but it, it really felt like in, in all four games, like it just didn't matter what mistakes Fnatic made. They just completely outclassed them and they were just... It was just a major region versus minor region kind of series where they just automatically win in the end because they're a better team and um, there wasn't really too much that that Gam could do. Like Gam even tried to, to lane swap in, in the first series and the, the second game and they seemed very uncomfortable with the strategy. <laughs> like they did not know how to execute that lane swap and everything they tried just kind of kind of fell apart. Then for the, the top esports series, um, and this is where I think it got really interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. I was really surprised by by Humanoid. Uh, not surprised in the sense that I, you know, I expected him to be able to to compete uh, with with Cream. But the top and jungle, like both Rasslock and Oscarinen, were also able to to perform really well. Like Oscar being able to match three six nine and it was a pretty big surprise, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, so with with top jungle doing doing really well and humanoid smurfing in the first couple of games everything was going the right way um june like you said also had an amazing series i think as of right now i would probably consider him the best western support like june has been really really good this tournament and yeah in in the entire lec spring split but the issue and and i hate like targeting individual players but poor noah was hardcore struggling versus jackie love every game like it was brutal there was there was one of the games um i think it was game two where fanatic's top side like was completely smurfing like oscar was destroying 369 with with camille raslog and humanoid had like amazing early games and all three of them got big advantages and when fanatic took tops nexus and won the game everybody were insanely far ahead Except Noah, who somehow was still a thousand gold down despite yep. being funneled so much global gold from his team throughout the entire game. And then, here comes the crazy part. So they're 1-1. One, one. The top mm-hmm. side is smurfing every game. All three of them did a fantastic job. What do they do? They put Oscar and Razork on goddamn tanks on Sack and Sijuani duty. And mm-hmm. they, they create a, a team comp fully centered around Noah, the guy who's been the only guy who's been struggling the entire series. He's he now plays Sire, laning with Rakan against Varus Ash. And they literally cannot breathe. They literally yeah. can't lane two with two. And <laughs> and all of a sudden the top side can't deal damage, they can't carry, they can't do anything. The guy who's struggling continues to struggle. And and from a draft point of view, I have absolutely no clue what the coaching staff was was thinking. Like honestly, it, it just f- feels like they threw uh, the team completely under the bus without unplayable draft. And, and sure, like there's things that Fnatic could have done differently and mistakes that happened. But it it just seems like 
the coaching staff completely misunderstood um, how the series was going. And instead of continuing to set uh, the top side up for success, um, yeah, they decided to play around the, the one guy who, who didn't have a good day. Yeah, and then, the, you know, invading top side level one, and they both end up burning flashes where June gets him out of a 4v5 to get a kill, but then they manage to set him up to get cooked in lane. That was super weird, too. I will say that one thing I've noticed with Fnatic in their drafts, something that I have really liked, and part of the reason why I think their top side's been so good, is they're playing solo laners with so much reach and combining it. Like, these Camille LeBlanc combos, we had TF to Leah uh, being played by them, synced up. I know that game ended up going sour, but they still had Talia Zack in that. So I, I think that we are having this identity kind of emerge from Fnatic, where we can play really fast on sides, and like if Noah's able to just pick up farm while things are crazy, then hopefully he can do enough in team fights where things are good. I know that he got blasted by Jackie Love in the series. I will give him the commiserations of there were were two games where the, like the level one set him up for a pretty bit like a lot harder than than what it should be. It still was a blasting from Jackie Love, it was, right? Mate, it was it, demolition. It was like, bad. <laughs> yeah, it was bad, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I can say the same thing about like cream in game one right like humanoids level one did help him in that lane but it was still a blasting for humanoid in his favor right uh but regardless i do think that's something that's interesting for Fnatic, and it's something i think that is gone in their favor uh and i think that we're gonna see more i'm curious like how the meta changes when we hit this bracket stage uh like if we do see more solo liners with reach i think camille is actually pretty strong in the current form uh but I'm interested if like that happens or if we get just something totally different that we haven't seen yet because sometimes when stages swaps like you get a stage swap in these tournaments you do see a big shift in the meta yeah the the major thing I think for the meta is Galio and Camille I think those two are very underutilized right now and we'll likely see yeah. more of them going into the main stage Galio top as well is something we've seen quite a lot in in solo queue and in scrims uh, so I'd expect them to come through I think Fnatic it's it's interesting because Noah was a big weak point. Obviously, he played well against Gam, but it's you know it's easy love. The guy had like sixteen straight losses before joining Gam uh, for playoffs. So I don't think you could put too much weight on him like improving. Maybe the motivation is there. Uh, Noah has been quite a motivation driven player. Um, I, I'm really interested in how they're going to match up into Genji. Uh, like kind of moving into the next Ooh, portion I'm, of the topic I'm about because, that one. yeah i so that's it, a hard it, one it's, <laughs> it's interesting right firstly genji yeah. great team one of the favorites of the tournament fanatic should lose we'll get that out there there's no eu yeah. hopium here right like we're, we're being analysts we're not being fanboys um but secondly there's like two levels to it fanatic love early skirmishing and love fights but mm -hmm. genji are very good at not taking early skirmishes and taking stuff on the other side of the map so i think play style wise very much genji favored However, Genji's one like not so great point is the fact that yep. Pays isn't like lane dominant. Pays and Lehens mm -hmm. aren't that lane dominant, specifically Pays. So Noah isn't just going to be 60 CS down at 12 minutes. Fnatic maybe can win a game because they don't have an AD carry. But, but it's just this fasting AD carry in lane. But medic. The, the problem is you, you may have you you may have an easier laning phase for for Noah. But then humanoids. <laughs> what do you mean, best Oscar player in the world, get... Boxer? I don't know. <laughs> it's so easy. They, they they have to get advantages versus Chovy, Hanyan, and Keen. Like that's not necessarily going to be easy. Like I'm sure humanoid can can smash Cream, but is he really going to do the same to Chovy? I hope so. I mean, then he really cements himself as that, like a literal that would god. Break like, you, Twitter. Be, that would be Twitter. I, I think that would break, but... like, League of Legends analysis. Chovy, yeah. widely regarded as the best player in the world right now. Like, I don't think yeah. there's many people that take that away from him. If Humanoid bodies him, even for one game, I'm going to tweet about it for years. It's just, <laughs> that's all on my Twitter. It's just, <laughs> hey, remember that time that, like, yes, yeah, 1631, whatever, 1737, sure, but Humanoid beat Chovy and then came and go. Can, can you imagine a timeline oh. where first Humanoid Smacks Jovi and then Caps destroys Faker. Like, no. that is the dream I, world. I, I, it's the, the dream world. I can't world. imagine it. It's so <laughs> far fetched, Boxer. It doesn't exist in my imagining. Too, too far. Oh, okay. Fair. It's that oh EU air you've got. They just filled it with opium for you. That, that I, I want to believe. That's a cool timeline. I, I will say one thing I'm really curious about is Genji in the lane swap scenario. 
Because I, I mean, I, I'm with Medic, right? I 100% agree that if there is any weak point for Gen G, it is Pays. Um, we have seen some teams use lane swaps to kind of get you out of the first few levels of bot lane matchups, especially like Ver if you're going into Varus Ash, right? You can lane swap and at least get out of the first three like three levels where Hellboy's lanes are brutal, and then get on a lot better footing. Uh, and I think one thing that everyone gives Gen G credit for is this team plays map extraordinarily well. Uh, it's really clean their lane assignments and how they rotate. And I'm wondering it like I'm pretty confident they'll pull that into the lane swap scenario. Okay. But I'm just wondering like if that is going to be a strength for them, or if playing the game standard and showing the map a uh, discipline that we uh, like already know from them uh, will be what they decide to lean on to. Because uh, uh, like not only is Chovy like best player in the world, but also Keen, really strong top laner, has always been that way with LCK, and now he finally you know gets to make that MSI debut uh, where we can really see him on this top team and see if he can live up to the standard uh, that he really has set in the LCK. Yeah, I think the reason that I have faith in Gen.G in lane swaps is if you look at game one of their finals specifically against T1, mm -hmm. it wasn't a set sequence, right? Every play was more of a, okay, this thing's happened here, so now let's adapt and do this thing, right? Yeah. It's, oh, so we pushed out mid with Rumble. This person's answering bot lane. Let's move Rumble to the bot side. Answer that way. We can then catch mid with this. We can do this. Um, mm -hmm. If it was like a set play, like a level one to three, then I think maybe you get thrown away by lane swaps, but it feels to me much more like the team just has a very good understanding of yeah, in the moment how to assign and how to mismatch so that they optimize mm -hmm. their gold. Um, which means, uh, I think, Jack talks a lot about it on the desk at the moment. He says he doesn't think we'll see as many lane swaps going into main stage because he thinks that, I'm going to use the word solved, it's not the exact wording he uses, but the, the concept is everyone understands how to deal with them, therefore then you don't get as much of a benefit out of doing it. I totally disagree. I think there's a lot more layers to lane swaps that we haven't seen enacted yet. And mm -hmm. I think teams like Gen G are the teams that I really expect to be able to absolutely shut an enemy jungler or an enemy top laner out of the game with optimal lane swapping. I, I also think, I mean, I heard both Jad and Emily talk about their, their frustrations about FlyQuest lane swaps, uh, you know, the other day, but I think lane swaps to, to a certain extent are like a bit misunderstood or, or people are like overreacting to them because while, um, you know, we we briefly talked about earlier, like, sure, FlyQuest's lane swaps didn't work out the, the way they wanted them to, but you could also see them, uh, you know, giving Brebo these huge advantages that yeah. one of the best teams in the world would, you know, yeah. would consistently get and use to destroy you like if you play against one of the best teams all they need is a 500 or a thousand gold lead and then the game is completely over like yeah, they're yeah. just going to completely and utterly demolish you and you're not coming back from that and i think a, a lot of these top teams are going to be able to really get some gigantic leads out of this and 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 not only secure these advantages but also draft in a way where um you know, they just have so many tools to utilize the lane swaps correctly and, and just have a, a bit of, of flexibility even where, um, you know, they just have a lot of cards in their hand and they can surprise their opponent in, in various ways by either lane swapping or not swapping. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the biggest thing with lane swaps is, like for me, if you're opting into it, like, yes, your bot lane going top is going to get diminishing returns, like given just how uh, the, plate, the plate defenses work up there or tower defenses, but... I think the real min-max part about it that I think is still... It's figured out, but I think it's very unexplored, all the scenarios, is how can you min-max your top laner's XP uh, on the weak side? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, yeah, that's the really big part about this. Like, you know, you're getting a new Broxa. Like, I, the very first game we saw that in the tournament was Fly versus PSG, and they found the scenario where Rumble was level 5 and they dove him when mm -hmm. he rotated back the top lane. And, like, we saw scenarios where, I mean, as you're saying, if you can give a small advantage like that to these teams that are just like just on another level that can be game right so I, i'm like really i really want to see if these teams kind of continue to figure this out and what can break it because i think that we know that scion is something that really breaks the rules of what happens in lane swaps but like is there another champ that people can dig deep and reach and find i i love the galio shout out medic because i feel like galio as a champ like 
if you put him in the top lane soul lane, he actually has a lot of ways to play defense against dives level one. Uh, like he brings a lot of wave clear. And then if you're under threat, you also have like a, a AOE taunt that's huge. You can proc Aftershock with it. That is the rune of choice for a lot of these people. Like I, I'm really interested what kind of champs people will reach to to try and uh, like if it's solved, like the play pattern's familiar, like almost what drafts is it does it work in? And also like how can they break that pattern? Because I feel like that's still very unexplored with swaps coming back in. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I also yeah. think... Uh, maybe Camille because you can like alcove game a little bit and then hook shot out if you get caught mm -hmm. to try and like soak XP in the alcove. Something we started mm -hmm. to see in the ERL was is like early sweeping of alcoves to make sure there's not a top laner just sitting in there having a little break and be like, oh, I'm just going to steal this XP <laughs> away from you. Uh, nice but moving on, let's look at uh, the main stage, uh, the bracket stage. I think it's interesting that MSI bracket is so solved. Like as soon as you get certain teams in, yeah. there's only there was only two permutations of the bracket, right? Because we don't have into intra regional matchups uh, allowed anymore so this week we have uh gen g fanatic we talked a bit about that already uh team liquid tez and g2t1 Kobe, do you want to kick us off with uh team liquid tez yeah um honestly this is one where like i think jackie love and mako i mean they show that they're just crazy good laners uh i think one of the big stories for tl was that yawn and core did up their laning a lot in playoffs by no means do i expect them to be able to hold a candle to this bot lane but i think the one stylistical or stylistic difference is that tl for me they're a team that's really disciplined on map and with top esports you're going to get some variance with how tn plays because tn he's going to play to walk into enemy jungle sometimes at times that are not good sometimes he, he is sometimes he sometimes, doesn't Who knows? <laughs> sometimes he is like god reincarnate and other times it's you know we're gonna fuck around and find out and things don't yep. go well and we saw that against fanatic right and for me like what i want to see from tl is i really am hoping that they are able to maintain that very disciplined macro that they showed in lcs because like that is quite good and if you bring that fundamental league of legends with you like, yes, sometimes when you get to this level, things can be broken uh, by the hands of elite teams. But I'm hoping that if it's not broken, we can see some of that from TL because I thought their mid games were quite good uh, in LCS. And I'm really hoping that can transition. And Top Esports, I mean, they're a team that I think like they are a contender to win. I don't think they're a favorite. <laughs> uh, but this is a team that for me also has quite a bit of variance in their play. And a lot of it is, is based on uh, TN, and then uh, we did see Humanoid get the best of Cream. So uh, I'm not expecting the APA to do that, but this isn't a perfect team. And if TL is disciplined enough, I hope they can use some of their fundamentals to hopefully punish mistakes that top esports will at least present them. Honestly, um, as a Team Liquid enjoyer, mm -hmm. I am very, very satisfied getting, getting top esports. I, I think Team Liquid should be matching really nicely into them. Um, Impact is the the one Western top laner that I'm not worried about at all going going into MSI. Like I think uh, maybe I'm gonna jinx everything now and he gets smashed. But <laughs> <laughs> I think Impact should be able to to easily hold his own against against anyone. He's yeah. proven that so many times in the past, and he's just gonna be a stable rock. I think, like I said, TN is gonna be a bit of a question mark, but. Umti should be should be able to handle him. I think APA's champion pool matches really nicely in the creams with both of them just primarily prioritizing control mages and cream is not gonna be the type of guy to play like really aggressive and pressure him. I think they're just gonna be scaling. And then again, it, it comes down to bot lane, right? And whether Yon and, and Core can actually survive versus Jackie yeah. Love and, and Mako and for that in particular I'm I'm not entirely sure, but if they find a way to do that, whether it's through uh, laning or lane swapping uh, away from them and avoiding the laning phase entirely. It's it's not like it's an impossible task and I think again, um, if Team Liquid can continue to, to play solid and disciplined I have a feeling Top will, will be the kind of team that will throw themselves at TL, make mistakes, TL can capitalize on them and then just play their, their style and play good macro to, to close it out um, but it, it's hard to say. Like I think there's a world where Team Liquid wins convincingly. There's also a world where they get completely smashed and just lose Rio. You never know. But I think that's also what makes it a really exciting series. Yeah, I think top often do get drawn into fights, right? Like that's how you have to play around them to 
try and get those advantages. Um, I think we uh, Top's mid-game macro is a bit undervalued. I, I do actually think they have really good lane assignments and they understand how to play and optimize their, their golden XP in mid-game. Um, so I don't think it's as much of a macro mismatch as perhaps other people do. Um, I'm yep. not saying that's what you were saying, Brooks. I just like I, I've seen a few people be like, "Oh, top esports only like fighting. That's all they do. Their typical oh, LPL yeah, team." Yeah. It's like, no, they, that's not true, right? They're not as good as like a Gen G or a BLG at playing the map, but they still do understand how to play the map, and they're quite smart about it. Um, mm -hmm. For Team Liquid, I like I wonder if the macro they showed against FlyQuest continues, or whether. FlyQuest kind of gave them more than they should have had in those games because I don't think they get as many opportunities to to mismatch parts of the map as they against top esports as they did against FlyQuest. I think FlyQuest's vision control in the finals was really poor. I think their macro generally, compared to the top echelon, isn't great. Um, and so I think against top esports, Team Liquid will have a bit more of a struggle. But we'll see. Um, and I would love it if they can get a game. I don't think Team Liquid ever take that series personally. I think they uh, they probably go 3-1 at best. Let's just do predictions. We never do predictions. I go 3-1 to Top Esports. Cubby. Uh, I'll go... I'll go 3 -oh top. I actually think Jackie Love is like on another level in this That's in this true, actually. Yeah. This, this guy's a freak. Uh, he, he's really ridiculous. Yeah. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the Hopium. I'll go 3-2 for Teal. Just because okay. I still okay. believe, like stylistically, this is this is the one one chance TL is gonna get. Like if we if we I speak agree. about LCK and LPL, top is the team they have to be able to beat. I, yeah, and we will see whether that's possible. Like I, I I just think if you compare the styles and players on on some levels, they're they're fairly similar. Um, so this is their best shot. Yeah. I'm gonna believe. Okay, maybe King Omzi comes back, Jax Penters, you know, they win the game. We'll I see. hope so. That will be we'll hype. We'll see. Uh, G2T1, though. A uh, song as old as time, a turtle as old as rhyme, or whatever. Uh, these guys, <laughs> for some reason, they always <laughs> seem to meet up at international competition. I will say, hear me out. Last time a German team, or a German league team, won e e EMEA Masters, right? Guess what year mm -hmm. it was? Was it 2019? It was 2019. Guess who just oh won God. EMEA Masters? Who did, Matic? A German team. I can't remember the name. Eintracht Spandau? I think it was Eintracht Spandau. <laughs> uh, it was the German yeah. team. Uh, look, I've been focused on MSI. I'm going to be honest. EMEA Masters has not been yeah. my priority. Um, yeah. Guess the last time Team Liquid made it to MSI? 2019. Guess the last Ooh, time. MSI. Is this well, where we're going? Was this brought up in a story who did meeting, beat, Who did G2 beat to make it to the MSI finals? T1. As I was oh, going to say five-year anniversary. It's the five-year so, anniversary. So you're saying they're yep. going to play Team Liquid in the final again? That's what I'm saying. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's my dream. That's my dream. Team Let's is go. Gonna <laughs> shit all over Chovy and G2 and Team Liquid are going to play in the finals. <laughs> and we'll the will those. be forgotten. We take you know? those. We take yeah. those. <laughs> we take those. But yeah, G2, T1. I think um, we've talked a lot about bot lanes. I think bot lane is the biggest mismatch again in this. Um, like Mickey... He's a very good player. Recently, he's looked like a pretty good inter. And I'm not saying that's entirely his fault. I think you know, sometimes when you play Nautilus, you just have to go in and you will die 10 times in a game because you're the guy that has to go in in these fights, right? Um, but he hasn't looked like he did in winter. I think in winter, he looked much better. And Han Summer, although stable, I don't think is a top-tier AD carry. I think he's a good AD carry, but I think against a... Guma carrier lane. I think Han Summer's really in a struggle. I think Mickey might struggle as well. So it, this is yeah. like Guma meta too. That's the scary part. That I, mm -hmm. I think Guma. It's it's really good meta for Guma. It, for me, like I know that we we're talking about lane swaps and breaking it. I'm wondering if G2 has some things cooked up because I, I I really think that's the only way that G2 has a chance. I think I don't say that as any disrespect for G2. I think T1 actually had a really good playing stage. Like for me, yeah. I gained confidence in T1 from what I saw from them. Uh, I think that the way that they were playing out three lanes, they're going to get punished more by these main stage teams. But this is a meta for me where I feel like they have a lot of levers to pull to play out three lanes. They are going to play out three lanes and T1 is very good at playing out three lanes. And so eventually their econ is just better than yours. 
And G2, this is a team, when I look at them, that's not when G2 is at their best. They're at the best when they're actually overloading sides and like trying to 4-1 and dropping waves in order to make plays that are really intelligent for me. Um, I don't think that matches up well in the T1. Uh, and so I'm a little bit worried for that. And I kind of want to see what G2 actually has in store uh, because this is a team for me that they've always been at their best when they're innovating. And this is a matter right now where I feel like there is still room for innovation. And I'm curious if they have stuff prepped because I think that's the one way that they can actually make this be uh, quite competitive. I'm I'm really curious to see um, how G2 not only comes together as a team, but how everyone's going to perform as, as individuals because um, you shouldn't disrespect anyone or take anything away from, from anyone from G2, but I do think in both winter and spring they kind of caps gapped like the entire league like in in spring uh when the the votes were published for for team of the split there wasn't a single person that had voted for anyone except caps for like the best mid laner in the league like it was so extreme i've never seen anything like it um broken blade was chosen as, as the top laner um but then jungle ad and, and support went went to different players and i think ultimately the name of the game has just been inconsistency for, for most of the G2 members where you never really really know what side of them you're going to see and I think that kind of inconsistency is going to be real real scary to have going into a, a team like, like T1 um, because we're going to need every single one of them to play that A game right like I think Broken Blade on a good day should be able to, to battle Seos I think Yike should be able to keep up with Honor. Uh, bot lane is a big question mark because, um, <laughs> I mean, you said that Medic Mickey has been one hell of an Inder uh, yeah. in, in spring. I think he's regressed a lot. Um, I think Hans is significantly worse in lane than he was last year. And that's the problem. That's where we, we saw um, Fnatic struggle against top esports as well. Like. The early laning is where the magic needs to happen because if you fall behind in the first ten minutes, you're not going to come back. Like the lead is just gonna gonna grow way too much. So um, I'm really curious to see how they're gonna stand up uh, compared to them individually, and also curious to see what they are prepared because they've always been known for for having some spicy strategies ready. Um, yeah. They they did uh, utilize the, the the lane swaps a lot at the end of the split in in Europe, so that's a strategy that they're comfortable with, and maybe they bring some extra spice from a draft point of view to perfect the lane swap and and try to catch T one of card. Um, I I do think like if we just play standard League of Legends with similar comps, <laughs> then I don't think they're gonna beat T one with what we've seen, but maybe they can surprise us. I think people forget that T1 took Gen G to all five games as well. Like it, it, that's the thing. T1 yeah. are not a second tier team from the LCK. They're, they're like a one point two five tier team. They're very good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my expectation is that T1 take that. I would say that's likely our match of the week as well. Um, Gen G Fnatic more likely to be one sided. TL Tez actually, I could I could see an argument for. Although I think Top Esports is going to win that one as well. Uh, BLG PSG, definitely not the match of the week. We're that's, not going to spend uh, a lot of a time one. talking about that matchup. Yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> and BLG won. Night like, <laughs> Elk oh, and Honor, pretty, pretty fucking good players. Uh, yeah. So moving on from that. Uh, sorry, do we all agree on match of the week? We happy with yeah. G2 do, do, we out, do we want to give out predictions too for this one? Oh, sure. So yeah, sorry. Yeah. You started the trend mm-hmm. medic, you know? Okay. Um, three... 3-2-T-1. Okay. 3-1-T-1. I'm also going to give G2 a, a gentleman's sweep in the sense that it's a T1-3-1. Yeah. I have enough faith in G2 to cook one game up. Yeah, so do um, I. And I, I I feel I'm being too biased. 3-2-T-1. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be honest. I think they only get fine. one game. I, I hope uh, you're right. I, and history says it's competitive, Medic, you know, if yeah. you're going off history. And I'm casting that series, so I want it to be competitive. Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. it should be fun. So, I, I think realistically, if you're a European fan, if you want you want G2 to go big, like, I think 
there's no way that ones? boot camp alone has improved them enough to beat C1 right now. If they do, I mean, I'll gladly take those those words back. Like, I'll, I'd love to see it. But yeah. I think if they are to like make a deep run of the tournament, this T1 series more than anything is going to be a huge learning lesson where they just need to grow as much as they possibly can, and then just start improving rapidly throughout the losers bracket, because. Uh, you can improve a lot during a, a, an MSI bootcamp playing all these teams and scrims, uh, but I think those official matches is where they can really, really take a lot. And even if they get free oaths, like I don't really care. They just gotta grow from it and, and do well in the, the next couple of series. So not do what FlyQuest did is what you're saying. Exactly. No tools, oh, okay. no uh, right. no e going, no getting complacent no. and losing, thinking you're gods and that you you don't need to learn anything. That would be a, a little disappointing. And yeah, maybe maybe a tad, maybe a tad. Uh, so moving on, some active League of Legends. Let's talk about people sitting on the bench right now. Roster rumors coming in to summer. Who have we got our eyes on, Roxa? Well, I think Carmen Corp is a bit of a, a spicy one. I mean, Carmen Corp has been one hell of a story since they came into the league. Like people have been waiting for them to join the LEC for years. They come in and they're just freaking speed running. But the problem is the speed running in the wrong direction to the very <laughs> bottom of the standings. There is split, which uh, <laughs> has been a bit anti-climatic. Uh, no, they're, now, they're just trying to be they, immortals they, of EU, you know, except like true. actually successful fan base. True, I guess. I, mean, BDS but... did do the same thing. Like BDS were <laughs> awful the first year, year and a half in the LEC, and then they got third true. like three times in a row. So. Trust the well, process. I, I think, the blue wall is only built one brick at a time, Broxer. Okay? I, it's I only up to here what's... right now. It needs to be up to here. What's crazy and a bit sad about it is that they made it clear how committed they're going to be to, like, the French players and, and, and whatnot going into this year. <laughs> and they, they wanted to stand by them. And now, with three replacements coming in, uh, Kana replacing Capuchard, Closer replacing Bo, uh, Vladi uh, replacing... Seeking. there's not a single French player left on the team like they're just all gone immediately yeah. and I, I honestly think like while I think it's really hyped they got Kana like an actual top top tier top laner um, it's a little bit sad if these guys that actually wanted to, to stand by their the French players and, and the pride for their country replace them and then start performing really well <laughs> like, yeah. I, I think that's that's a little bit sad because I, I like that they were loyal to, to these guys who had played with them in, in the ELs for so long and, and gave them a shot in the LEC. Obviously, mm -hmm. it didn't work. Obviously, they had to make a change. And I, I do think that the changes are exciting, also a bit random. Like, I, I think nobody expected them to get Kana. Like, I, the, the fact that this guy even that was wild. Committed, committed to the team and is willing to take that risk crazy like crazy because oh, so he, he hasn't I'm been playing there. so far this year but still like joining Carmen Corp in the state they're in it's like that can literally be like a move that takes you back to the top or just ruins your career but speaking of committing and saying yes do you think Abadage saw this roster and said no by any chance I think Abba didn't see Kana I think really? Abba was offered before Kana and then said no and then they got kind of afterwards so so like a no after thanatos was out and like yeah then like, uh, like, like, oh, like no, that you're not getting the guy that i okay. thought you were gonna get i'm gonna say no now and then they're like oh actually we got kind of and now he's like oh mm, maybe, yeah. maybe you would have been fun to be part of that roster the uh, timing of all this was was yeah. quite interesting um, it's also possible he just didn't want to only do it yeah, yeah. what could be only a three-week project right like if they if yeah. they follow their current form, they don't even get out of the the of the bottom two, and then well, you're only, and, you're only there for three weeks. And because of that, they need to pretty much top three to try and make yeah. the like they, they they really need to push. So, so top three gets you guaranteed season finals. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you are outside of that, becomes championship points. Depends on who wins as well, because yeah. we give a certain amount of positions to the fight uh, the winners of each split. So yeah, it's uh. We'll see. That's uh, going to be a really interesting story to follow, for sure. Mm -hmm. Moving on to SK, they have brought in two Koreans for their bot lane, replacing Exekick and DOS. It's Rahel and HH as their bot support. Um, 
a little bit disappointed that we're seeing the two import slots when there were good players elsewhere, but it seems like a pretty uh, quick decision, uh, a decision made under a, a time crunch for SK. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if I were to make changes with SK, it would be the bot lane. They gave them a couple splits to figure it out. They did not. Um, but to my understanding of ERLs, there's actually quite a bit of like bot lane talent. Like uh, my understanding is the ecosystem, this split was that top lane imports were not a surprise. Bot lane imports were a little bit more. Uh, and you know, you got names like Unforgiven that are being considered for LEC slots. Someone that I think is quite good and has shown that he's good in both regions and just isn't in LEC. And so we have these imports, which, uh, Quite interesting, you know, you, you guys are slowly uh, becoming more like NA, one one Korean import uh, at a time, you know? <sighs> it hurts because it's true. We're not there yet. You're not the, like the 50% of our players are NA, uh, non-NA, but we are getting there. And like, it's it's imports like this that frustrate me because it's not like a Photon, as you say, or mm -hmm. uh, a Jun. Uh, and maybe, maybe they will be. But for Jun, Jun was a question mark when he joined. Yeah, like, he was. Putting it out there. Yeah, People so were maybe skeptical I'm, about Jun. Maybe I'm results-based analyzing my... Analyzing? That's the word. Maybe I'm results-based analyzing it, but uh, from what I've heard, the expectation isn't that they will take the league by storm. I also think for them, it's like if you're, you're SK and you decide to import. Like, normally you would, you would take those risks if you aim to, to like, go really big and find some, uh, you know, some, some hidden uh, diamonds, uh, to, to say the least, but... Man, these guys have to be absolutely cracked for for SK to make a deep run and, and make it to Worlds. And I think in most cases, just going for some homegrown talent and, and going the safer route and trying to look into how you can create something more long term, potentially going into next year, would would probably be a, a little smarter. But then again, like these guys come from uh, DK challengers and NS challengers, they have some experience. Uh, maybe they can maybe they can surprise us. I think it's also worth noting that. For Exa Kick and DOS, I mean, they have not looked good this year. Uh, but for Exa Kick in particular, this must be a horrible situation to be in because going into last year, it was rumored that he was offered to join Fnatic as the starting AD carry in LEC. He declined the offer and opted into SK instead. <laughs> and man, yeah. was that a, a career defining decision, sadly <laughs> for him, a bit of a negative one going in the, the wrong direction. Yeah, well, he always wanted to stay with DOS as well, because then they play together in mm -hmm. ERLs, and then whenever he joined a team, he was like, I want DOS with me, I want DOS with me, and yeah, it's it's such a fall from grace, because Exo started really well. Like, when he joined the league, he looked really good, one of our better AD fairies, and then it always seems like winter's good, spring is a bit worse, summer is even worse, so SK are just getting, getting off the train before it, you know, leaps off the tracks uh, in the summer split. Uh, Giant X though making some changes as well. Antonio coming in for Oda Wame. Uh, Yuan in the jungle. Uh, world champion Yuan coming in. So uh, <laughs> the, the yeah. reason DRX made worlds. Yep, yeah, that you know can't take it oh. away from him. Can't take it away from him. I mean, he's got a bit. He's got a big project to do the same here with Giant X. You know. Oh, hey. If we get Giant X skins at the end of the year, I will shave my head. If we if they win Worlds, I will shave my head. I'll do it publicly. You know, I'll Matic, I'm, I'm an NA. I'll, I'll join you too. You know, nice. I, okay, so we're all shaving well, our heads you know? if Giant X win, yeah. including Ginny, as well. who is not here. And I've been <laughs> saying she's going to do it with us. Excellent. Um, but yeah, I think the loss of Odo, I don't think Odo was the problem. He wasn't having a great year, but he, like... I don't think he was the issue with this uh, Giant X team. I think Yuan in for Peach as well. I don't, like the problem is, I think the whole collective is the issue for Giant X. It's like, what? What? Yeah. Can you point where the problems are? Everywhere. <laughs> so That's a great point. maybe maybe this will fix something. Uh, but I don't think it, it alleviates the underlying issue of Giant X, which just they didn't seem to have synergy. They didn't seem to know how they wanted to play the game. They had that one really good game near the end of playoffs. Was it playoffs or regular season? Near the end of regular season where they all seemed coordinated and they managed to win. I think it was against G2. Was it G2 that they beat? Anyway, yes. one really good game against G2. And apart from that, they look middling at best. Honestly, that team is... <laughs> it's kind of giving me... CLG flashbacks and vibes and, and not the good kind where the oh, problems no. just go, go so deep and no. it's just so cursed that 
it's going to be really really hard for them to 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 find a solution until they just hit like a reset button and and just try to do something entirely different cuz I don't know like they they've already tried to to make some changes and like at the roster to their coaching staff none of it has ch has changed like at all um I also heavily doubt that these two roster changes are going to do absolutely anything um it, it's just a team that's just destined to to fail almost un until they just yeah again just literally kick everybody and 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 do something something different for next year well, at least with the Antonio joining, we got a pretty iconic tweet from Shocks with an old photo from the archives. That, oh, that was that so was, funny. Yeah, that, that was, was really so good. funny, actually. Yeah. <laughs> she found a. I don't know if you saw it, Boxer. She found a photo from 2016, 2013, some some way back when, you know. And yeah. it was the Antonio had tweeted, "Got to meet this incredibly gorgeous woman today, or incredibly sexy woman today." Yeah, <laughs> so she found it. <laughs> she just she it. it. <laughs> so, I'll see you soon. Welcome to the LEC. Yeah. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> it was really, it was really funny. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, on the yeah, other side cool. of the pond, though, um, C9 making a couple of changes. Thanatos uh, is coming into top lane. Probably the the uh, most excited I have been for an LCK Challengers player, ever. Thanatos, for years, Chronicler has told me, this is the guy that we have to watch. This is the guy yeah. that oh, I hope no one steals from us, is actually the, the wording that he used. Mm -hmm. So for him to go over to C9 replacing Fudge, I think Fudge obviously was struggling um, mm -hmm. after being relatively good for a few years. Uh, I think it's a, big, it's a good change. Uh, I think it definitely improves C9. I, I think for me, like, I, I hope that Fudge finds a landing spot and kind of regains his confidence because I feel like from watching him, like he wasn't playing with the confidence I'm used to seeing from Fudge. In terms of Thanatos, though, it was so weird because like going into this off season, I just assumed that Thanatos was going to be the top laner for D+. I, I, mm -hmm. I really did. I, I it was just like, all right, Lucid and Thanatos are in there and we're going to see how well he does in LCK. And then it's like, he's nowhere to be found. He's just not on the team. And then all of a sudden he spawns in on C9 with Reaper. Like, it's pretty crazy that c9 picked this up that said uh i think this almost compounds on the issues that c9 had like you have to now incorporate someone who will be picking up english with this team and this was a team where it's like okay we are going to win lane and if we don't win lane we literally have a zero percent win rate if we don't lead at 15 and i don't think thanatos like given that he won't be speaking his native language is going to help with this now his him coming in i understand reaper coming in as well because obviously reaper is very fluent in english can be bilingual and translate easily for thanatos and with his team right like that, that's really valuable for thanatos yeah. to have behind the scenes not to mention reaper just you know being a successful coach and player too in his career uh but i don't know if this is what c9 needed i i, I think that c9 needs to do some soul searching as well because this is the team that should be playing at MSI if you look at this team on paper in our region for NA and the fact that they were not only nowhere to be found but like just got blown out of the water uh, in their series is tough I I honestly think this <laughs> I'm surprised you feel that way about the changes because I think this is huge and this could change almost everything for C9 to the point where really? it could almost be favorites going into the next split um, they, they were already favorites I mean, for this I, split well, the thing is, I, I mean, I rate Reaper extremely high. I, I okay. think there's a lot of coaches like him in in the Western League scene where I know a hundred percent surely that he's actually legitimately gonna put his foot down, and he's just gonna show no mercy. Like he's gonna have so high expectations for these players. He's gonna bring really good structure. He's gonna make sure that they actually take every game really seriously in in, in scrims and on stage. And I know from when I played in NA and he was on C9 that I loved playing C9 because they were like one of the only teams in the league that would always show up on time that would always take scrims 100% seriously and they would just dunk on us and then Rebot I'm sure was a, was a big part of that because you as the coach are the one who has to put those expectations on, on the players right so I, I think him coming in and being able to bring some of that is going to be a huge change in the in a positive direction. Not to take anything away from Miffy, but I just mm -hmm. think the coaching styles are slightly different. Um, and then Thanatos, uh, 
could be huge. I think top lane generally is top and AD carry are probably the easiest roles to, to plug into a team, both in the middle of the year, but also if it's someone that's not super comfortable with the language, because the most important synergies are between jungle, mid and support, like those are the ones that have to be vocal, control vision, put push the game forward. Sure, AD carry and top can also have an impact, but you can isolate them a little bit more. And, and yeah, I, I wouldn't be so worried about that. So, I don't know. I'm super excited for C9. I think this this change is, is exactly what they needed. A couple of other changes are over in NA. In a row is joining IMT, obviously a part of the Golden Guardians lineup last year. Uh, led them to mixed successes uh, across the course of uh, his time there. Dealers that's also getting in Liquish for top lane and Treats joining as assistant coach. I'm I'm happy that Liquish has found a spot. I think we all talked about him as a top lane yeah. that should have a team. Um, so I'm very yeah. happy for him. I don't, I'm not sure how much like Immortal and Dingus are now challenge near the top. I don't think they do, but I think like the the addition of Liquish will definitely help out Dignitas. Yeah. Um. I mean, I'm I'm also happy. Like, obviously, you guys work with Treats. I think Treats has a really good mind for the game. I mm -hmm. I don't know if Treats is was hoping to still compete. Uh. I think he's a great competitor, but I also think he has a really good mind to help that team out behind the scenes, too. Um, I will say that for an arrow, I think the biggest criticism for Immortals is, like, they aren't trying to build anything, you know? <laughs> like, at least when they first started off, like, they had Gilioto there, and he actually was the coach for a couple years, and he was trying to build upon what they were doing year by year. Uh, and ever since that's happened, there hasn't been a, a split where a, a coach hasn't lasted more than one split at Immortals, which is a real head scratcher. More than the um, split? Yes. No no one has lasted more than a split. Holy. Okay, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's rough. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Excellent. I, 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 I can double check this that? on Leaguepedia, but we, I think we're on like our fifth coach in five splits here. Wow. Uh, for IMT. That's pretty rough, right? To, like for being a, a bottom team. Um, An arrow, like he really helped build that Golden Guardians project, right? Yeah. And regardless of like what kind of success they had, they were a team that like by the time Anero started to where they ended, they went from being a bottom to middling tier team to a middling to top tier team. Yeah. And, team and that's almost what, qualified for what's right? Like yeah, exactly. Like yeah. that's what Immortals needs, right? Uh they would love to be in the case where it is a disappointment to not qualify for worlds. That that's a very unfamiliar territory for IMT here in NA. So in terms of people for the project, I feel like Anero is a great pickup for them, because uh, if he's allowed to actually exact his plan or what's going on, like he is someone that has proved he can build things up, uh, and that is what IMT needs in the building. So I'm really hoping that he can be that person for that squad. Who, uh, to be fair, everyone said they were a lot better in scrims than what the record showed on stage. Uh, and also, I do want to give IMT credit. I know that they were scrimming behind the scenes after they did not make playoffs. Like, they were scrimming all the playoff teams. And they were playoff teams were really happy they stuck around the scrim because they won the practice against IMT. Like, that, that was a decent team. So, yeah. um, I, I appreciate the motivation. I think Anero is actually a really good hire for the project. Well, we'll see how well he can do over the next, uh, however long like a couple of months maybe a couple of years see if he sticks around or if he's <laughs> yeah <laughs> like the rest of the IMT uh, bosses finally uh last major topic of the week Vanguard now apparently it bricks PCs but then Riot said it doesn't brick, brick PCs and actually only 0.03% of people are having issues with it then Riot said oh all of these cheaters are trying to make people not like Vanguard so that we get rid of it because they can't cheat anymore. What are our Damn. thoughts, Lats? That's a great PA line right there. I, yep. Like the PR firm that gave that line to Riot, <sighs> pay, pay them overtime. It's really <laughs> rare that we have good PR in, in esports and competitive yep. gaming. That's a good line. Um, Twitter, Twitter was very different. Uh, there was also some... I'll call it shenaniganeries going on on the uh, subreddit with uh, some threads potentially being taken down hey, over hey. Vanguard. Um, it was all very weird. We're just going to leave it at that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what's going on. My, my PC is fine. That's all I'll say. Um, but I, the team I'm helping out with behind the scenes right now, we might have had to cancel scrims that day because someone else's PC was not. So, yeah. uh, that, that might say enough, you know. I... I I mean, personally, I, I don't really know what to think of it. I mean, I've heard a lot of 
<laughs> negatives about Vanguard. Vanguard is a software. I've had countless people coming to my stream telling me that they just straight up quit the game and they refuse to play until until it's entirely gone. Uh, I'm curious to to find out later. They must be cheaters. How many, no, no, <laughs> how yeah, many? They must be. <laughs> Anyone that how complains is a cheater <laughs> and they, a fraud. They must, they must <laughs> be cheaters. Uh, no, but I'm curious, like how much it's actually gonna affect uh, negatively. But obviously, there's positives as well. Like I, I saw a post a couple of days ago about how uh, the moment the changes came in, Seraph's win rate win had, like dropped pretty significantly. Drop. Yeah, uh, b because Wait, apparently, like most of the scriptors <laughs> were, were playing Seraph. I also haven't seen any scriptors in my games yet this patch, which is great because before they would be in like I don't know one or two games a day or more yeah um there's been a lot of issues that have, have piled up over the last couple of years and it feels like this has happened before a few times in league where riot gets rid of the the cheetahs like entirely for a while but then eventually they find a way to come crawling back and then they have to make a change and then they get rid of them and you know you you just you just can't fully stop it and if vanguard is is what it takes to to make sure that the games are actually fair and reasonable i'm okay with that if there's major issues um that that, that continue uh, throughout the next months hopefully riot can can solve most of them before yeah. they actually turn into a, a legitimate huge problem i i will say like from a very high level approach um one of the things that sucks for vanguard is that i believe it did up system requirements uh to run vanguard and i think one of the things that League's done a really good One job sec. of. Wait, let me just medic. You need to stop scrolling. Oh, Pick sorry. I was looking at <laughs> I was looking at other kernel level anti cheats because I was going to make a point about something. But now, yeah, we'll I'll wait yeah. until after Cubby's finished their point. Um, I I think you you almost need to like just not touch your mouse. I'm like not touching a, anything, Maz. Like, you, you, okay. You, 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 you don't believe, like... Look, I know, I, I, I apologize. I, maybe the microphone's over here. If I speak over here, can you guys hear me more? Hello? Yeah, I, actually, it's more muffled, okay. yeah. That's, that's probably where the microphone is. I mean, it, it's um, fine. Yeah, I, I just obviously, want to apologies to my audio in this. In this my, uh, it, it's fine, it's fine. No, I, I'm apologizing to the audience, Maz. I'm not apologizing to you. You have to fucking deal with it, man. Well, are, we, are we recording <laughs> again? I don't even know, man. Yeah, we're recording. It's fine. I'm good. <laughs> uh, I, but we, yeah, I'm in China, three, so it's difficult. We have three separate time zones across the planet recording right now. I feel like uh -huh. that's pressing off on its own. It is uh, the, four, actually, because thing... Matt, uh, our producer... That's true. Is is in the UK, right? So, that's true. Um, one thing that Riot's done really well is I think League system requirements are at a minimum to yeah. run. Uh, it's actually like quite low compared to most other games and especially other mobas. Uh, so Vanguard did up that, and I know that like I had a friend who they aren't able to play anymore. Like, they would have to upgrade their PC to play, and so that that does suck as well. Like accessibility to the game, which is something that League like and Riot does a very good job of. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, it's always been one of the reasons League is so accessible, right? Um, yeah. I think that I I don't know enough about PC architecture to argue whether mm -hmm. kernel level anti cheat is a good or a bad thing. Generally, I will say the cheaters are at kernel level, so the anti cheat kind of has to be there. Otherwise, the anti the cheaters can just bypass the anti cheat, right? Um, yeah. We'll all forget about this in about six months' time because that's how people's brains work. Uh, and especially gamers like Valorant. True. You don't hear anyone like really anymore complaining about Valorant having Vang up. And it's had it for four years, right? Other games that have kernel level anti-cheat. So if you don't want to play League of Legends because you don't want Vanguard to have kernel level anti-cheat, you can't play Apex Legends, Fortnite, Paladins, Player Unknown Battlegrounds, Rainbow Six Siege, Planet Side 2, H1Z1, DayZ, Ark Survival Evolved, Dead by Daylight, For Honor, and many, many, many more. Kernel level anti-cheat yeah. is not a new thing. I entirely respect your decision to say I'm not going to play League because I don't want Vanguard having access to the like kernel level on my PC. However, if it's just you're saying I don't want Riot to have it, well then why are you okay with all these other games having it? Assuming you play Good those games, gaming. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I still respect it if people want to don't want to play it. I think if it is causing issues with PCs, obviously that fucking sucks as well. Um, yeah. But... One in ten master games had a cheater in them, or had a scripter in them, and now they don't because like we've stopped people cheating. It's a competitive yeah. game at the end of the day. I, you're gonna, I remember a scripting Zerath I face a lot longer than I'll remember this Vanguard stuff. So yeah. 
overall, I, I mean, that's a net positive by those metrics right there. Yeah, exactly. No, but I swear, like, for months, half of the time I saw somebody lock in Siri, the Siri was just yeah. invincible because it you could never hit them with a skill hit. shot. Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you just couldn't hit them. Like, yeah. almost every time Siri was locked in on the enemy team, I knew I either lose the game or I dodge. It was it was <laughs> depressing times, and now, funnily enough, all the series I can actually outplay so, them. They well, actually you can suck hit now. Them? It's fantastic. Man. I love it. <laughs> uh, okay, so f to round out the show, let's go through a couple of community questions. First one is from Kimpan ninety six. Could this fantasy roster beat G two? Oda Omni, Bo, Niski, Kazi, and Lebrov. The answer is no. Thank you very much for the question. Next question <laughs> is G2 <laughs> asked us, will G2 be top one at MSI? The answer is also no. Thank you for the question. Leave your questions <laughs> and comments down below. This has been The Jungle. Thank you for watching.